Good afternoon. Thank you for holding up through the day. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm Bill Joyce. I'm the CEO of Advanced Fusion Systems, AFS, uh, we call it. Uh, hopefully this is, uh, there you go. AFS uh, offers EMP protective devices uh, for transformers and generators and filtered feed-throughs for shielded enclosures. Uh, we also manufacture a wide range of EMP sources uh, with voltages up 250 kV per meter. Uh, I was quite pleased when John in his earlier talk mentioned some of our products, but I wasn't sure how I should react when he told me these sources are cheap and easy to make. <laughs> so, uh, We also offer some test services, including three large EMP cells uh, that we're working on right at, right at the moment. Um, question when you're starting for protection, are you going to protect against the E1, the E3? And here's some things I think you need to think about. The fundamental physics governing the generation of a nuclear EMP pulse demands that if E3 is present, you're going to have E1 and E2 as well. Uh, the reverse isn't necessarily true. One can generate a non-nuclear EMP pulse that only has E1. Uh, so caution is advised if you're designing the system. Uh, there's little sense in just protecting for E3 in an environment where E1 is anticipated uh, coming down the path. There are numerous uh, extremely powerful non-nuclear sources have been demonstrated. Some have been certified by the government with field strength in excess of 250 kV per meter. Uh, some of these devices are portable. Uh, this pre presents a threat which exceeds the levels of protection that are afforded by systems that just comply with MIL 188-125A. Uh, these threats are relatively inexpensive, as John said, and lend themselves to multiple simultaneous attack scenarios. Uh, the non-nuclear EMP threat arises from the ability to build extremely powerful radio transmitters that can duplicate the waveform uh, and the intensities of EMP portion of a nuclear explosion. And the technology exists to build these transmitters of this nature that are portable. Uh, and with many times uh, the effects that a large nuclear EMP uh, pulse will give. And shown in the picture here is a 35 kV per meter system that was built in collaboration program with the U.S. Army. As you see, it fits easily into a small panel truck. Uh, the best current available technology for E1 protection consists of MOV devices and lightning gaps. Uh, depending on these for protection is questionable in a nuclear EMP environment and unacceptable in a non-nuclear EMP environment. If the following graph uh, sets the current technology and some AFS technology against the threats of these all on the same scale, uh, the black line is lightning, uh, the dark red is an EMP pulse, uh, the light red up above is a non-nuclear EMP pulse, and the blue line is where the protection starts with MIL 188. Uh, the green line is where protection would start with a bitron. Uh, clearly, the mill line looks like it takes all the steam out of lightning. A little questionable about the EMP pulse, but certainly not enough for the non-nuclear EMP, because remember, that's a log scale, so you're talking about things that are a lot more powerful up above. Uh, the 188 is the current U.S. government standard for high-altitude EMP protection. It's widely used as the design criteria, uh, but the standard has some flaws in it. It utilizes a swept, narrow-band source for shield effectiveness testing. That ignores the physics of the response of materials to an ultra-wide EMP pulse. Uh, AFS will offer testing services that exceed MIL-188 and get a more realistic environment for both non-nuclear 
and nuclear EMP environments. The BITRON uh, that was shown on the pri prior slide is a bidirectional electron tube designed for AC power electronics switching and control. Uh, it's a versatile family of tubes. It's suitable for all power electronic switching and control applications with voltages up to 1.2 million volts and a current rating in the hundreds of kiloamps uh, for over voltage protection, and that includes EMP protection. In excess of MIL-188, the BITRON is designed to operate in the EMP environment and is capable of handling repeated pulses at a multi kilohertz rep rate. Uh, the size varies with uh, the uh, voltage that you're talking about. Uh, units at 35 kV and down are 12 inches in diameter, 18 inches long. Uh, units for 1,250 kV AC operation are approximately six foot in diameter. The systems provide an external contact signal to trip external protective devices. Um, all the systems are self-resetting and capable of withstanding and protecting uh, in an environment where repeated attacks in rapid succession. And of course, by definition, if they're able to do that, they'll protect against lightning of all voltages. This is a picture of one at 25 kV and 2 kA, uh, 15 inches long and, and 12 inches in diameter. Uh, obviously much bigger at 125 kV uh, and 2.5 kA, about 6 foot in diameter, and the length is equivalent to what you normally would have for an insulator at, at that kind of voltage. Um, AFS uh, protection device uh, for EMP is called EPS. Each of these is a, a dielectric vacuum enclosure, a ground conductor, and some specialized internal structures. The devices implement the field collapse protocol. Uh, detection and operation are autonomous. It protects both against E1 and E3. Uh, it provides hardened data output containing the information on the EPS status and e EMP event alerts. Uh, the units are available from 4160 to 1 1.2 MV. Uh, this is a picture, the same as John had shown earlier, of an artist's concept of what they would be protecting a large transformer. We have a, a 4138 Bitron, which has the same electrical characteristics, but it's, it's built for, it's optimized for bulkhead mounting as a shielded protective feed-through for the bulkhead. It exceeds the mill specs. It's available on 275 kV and 250 kA, and the tube is designed for e EMP protection and transient suppression. And it looks like that. Uh, AFS has some protective approaches for GMD. Uh, obviously, the field collapse uh, EPS system that we talked about takes care of E1 and E3. Uh, we also have a neutral blocking device uh, for a Kappaman method of GIC neutral blocking. And that's available as an integrated system through Phoenix Electric. Uh, it's also available as a switch itself to all qualified customers. Looks like this at 35 kV and 200 kA. 24 inches long, 18 inches in diameter. I'm afraid we have a typo because it's a lot heavier than that. This is our facility manufacturing and office facility in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, this is a satellite view. Uh, if you saw the building right now, it has a lot more things on the roof, and we're on con in construction on the one side. And uh, one of the main elements uh, being worked on now is the EMP and a GIC uh, test facility. It's essential that we test devices under realistic conditions. Uh, 
but we weren't able to find EMP test facilities capable of online testing devices up to a million volts. Uh, so we decided as part of our commitment to this arena, we would construct some uh, world-class EMP test facilities. The facility can inject simulated GIC uh, signals uh, to 25 kV uh, DC and 100 kA. Uh, the, the facility will uh, allow testing uh, up to voltages of 1.2 million volts AC or DC and under conditions uh, that closely replicate what you'd see in the real world, uh, load conditions of 10 megawatts and sub -pico 100 picosecond um, pulsed electric uh, feeds. Um, so we think this is, uh, you know, moves us to uh, something that will be uh, quite practical and uh, give us the kind of information that we need to know on, on these devices. Uh, the cells, we have three cells. Uh, we're just finishing the steel lining on the first of them. Uh, it's 80 foot by 40 and 20 foot high. Uh, the second two cells are 135 by 50 and 50 feet high. They'll all test at 250 kV per meter. All cells can duplicate the magnetic field conditions of the largest transmission lines. Uh, digital instrumentation greater than 50 GS per second per channel and eight simultaneous channels and less than 20 picosecond resolution on the data. Uh, this is some contact information. If I were you, I would steer to Curtis Spurnback because he's the inventor of all this. Um, but I'm happy to take your calls on, on anything uh, that you might like to know. With that. Thank you very much. Um, we should first start by giving them a quick round of applause, but I'd like to open it up for some questions. I can imagine a few of you might have some, <clears throat> but I'd like to uh, basically start with one. Um, obviously, this took a lot of commitment and investment to do this. It's interesting to see the private sector coming to the table to make this happen. Um, maybe you can give us a, a sense of the vision that you've had to have to make this come about and how this compares to your experience uh, in, in the large corp, you know, Fortune 100 companies and, and the difference between this and, and what this all might mean to the rest of us who are trying to observe that mix of activities that you've done over the years. Uh, well, a bunch of questions there, but uh, to the first one, you know, how long have we been at it and so on. Uh, Curtis actually uh, worked uh, on a lot of military applications over quite a few years. So these systems were a long time in, in developing, um, but they are uh, proprietary products, i.e. presented to the military in a, in a finished form. Um, we put together the, the business as it stands right now. I started working on that about four years ago, and we'll have about 60 million invested. Uh, in this environment, it's very, very difficult uh, to get people to ante up, so we did it ourselves. Less arguments that way. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been very interesting, a lot of learning for me. Uh, I think that uh, the other question is how different is it from being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company? Well, when you're when you're buying something and you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, uh, you talk, talk to somebody who talks to the realty department. They go out and search and find it. Uh, when you're doing what we did, you know, you, <laughs> you get your shoes on and walk out the door and start looking yourself. So uh, you get an appreciation for a, a lot of jobs uh, that have a lot more depth than you may they ever thought they did. And that's part of the fun of, that's part of the fun of doing it. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions? Um, I see hands, but I don't know, maybe shy, but people just scratching their heads. Um, Mary has one. 
I'll never bring the microphone to you. Mary Lasky, how many people, um, how many utilities have actually invested with you? Pardon? How many utilities are actually anting up for this? Uh, well, investors, I guess you were saying. You know, if you're talking about investors, uh, we did the investment ourselves. Um, uh, the response from utilities has been very positive. Um, in addition to EMP, we, we have some current limiting devices and, and some other things that uh, uh, utilities, I, I would guess they probably have that on their front burner before EMP protection. Uh, and I think the, the issue is the one that uh, one of the speakers talked about earlier. It's hard to get people interested in an event that has a terrible outcome, but it has a very low probability that's going to happen in the near future. I think when people understand how, and I hate to say easily, but I'm going to use your words, how easily you can make one of these false devices uh, I'm afraid we're going to find that that's not an event with low probability. It's an event with very high probability, and it's not too far down the path. Yeah, I know we often uh, talk about issues that are overwhelming, and lots of people think of uh, climate change. They think of peak oil. And at any particular point in time, as they think about it, when they're in a really tough economy, they say, well, this year is really bad. And maybe I have 50 years and my grandkids can figure it out, or maybe I have 10 years. But there's, what's interesting about these scenarios that we're looking at, it could be in five days or five months or 50 days or five years, not necessarily 50 years. And it's sort of like the sense of Hurricane Sandy, the storm is coming. And it doesn't matter that times are hard and this is a tough problem. The storm's coming, so we need to do something about it. I think the people in the, I think the, people in the Middle East will have this protection long before the U.S. does. Because when you talk about climate change and you're in some place that the temperature is 130 degrees and all of a sudden your air conditioning is gone, man, that's climate change. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Oh, we have a question. Down. Go ahead. Yes, I was going to ask you, uh, ask you about commercial manufacturers of inten uh, intentional uh, EMP devices. I think it's now been publicly disclosed there's at least one. It's Boeing uh, with their Champs drone. Uh, do you know of other uh, commercial manufacturers? Uh, uh, well, we call ourselves commercial. Um, and Curtis uh, manufactured these uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, so they've been manufactured for, for a long period of time. I see a hand. And this might be the last question, unless another one pops up really fast, because we have a few other uh, items to take care of before we go. I, I just have a quick question, Dave Greer, International Guard. You mentioned uh, about the cost. Other people were in the room all day are saying cost for protection is pretty low, uh, and you were joking about it. I was just wondering how, uh, how much something... Uh, the protection would cost... Is it, is it very expensive to implement something like this? I'm assuming yes. And uh, is the Department of Defense interested in, in uh, purchasing these things? Yeah. Uh, they, they aren't cheap. It's very dependent on the size. But if, if you're talking about a big transformer and you're protecting it, it's a significant dollar amount. But if you look at it as a percentage of the transformer cost, it's a very small amount. Uh, obviously, when we get down in size, then they're much cheaper. Thank you very much. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. Quite a bit of investment, dedication, focus, and leadership to make this happen.